Commission will come to order. We'll begin with introductions. My name is Nick Neptune, Chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission. Mr. Caruso. Uh, Joe Caruso, Vice Chair and Chair of the Policy Committee. Tammy Stern um, on the Planning Committee. Kari Barsness, member of the Policy Committee. Dwight Otwell, and currently without a committee. Is it my turn? Yeah. Uh, Mike Thor, uh, on the Outreach Committee. Mary Jo Gallenbeck, Planning Committee. Brian Thomas, Outreach Committee. Celise Bravo Taylor, Planning Committee. Oh. <laughs> Barbara Godwin, <laughs> Micro Mobility Coordinator. <laughs> uh, Fontaine Burris, Bicycle and Pedestrian Program Manager. Thank you, everyone. God bless Barbara Godwin. <laughs> uh, we will proceed with an approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? A uh, motion from Commissioner Bravo Taylor. Do I have a second? Yeah. Yeah. Second from Commissioner Stern. Uh, I guess we'll have a vote uh, on the approval of the minutes. Aye. 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 Approval is unanimous. We'll now proceed to public comment. Uh, I believe we've got a couple folks to make public comment. We'll start with, I see Mr. Johnston, Doug Johnston, if you want to proceed. Reminder that public comment is limited to three minutes. Thank you. And I will give you um, a one minute warning. Thank you very much. Uh, I sent a, a forwarded an email with the two pictures of two locations that uh, I'm gonna be referring to tonight. One is on Milburney Road and one is on Ratchford Drive. Both of those are the topic of a past zoning for Milburney and a future zoning for Ratchford Drive. And I'm hoping to see that uh, an effort is made in the rezoning decisions and by the property owners to give attention to the appearance of the Greenway, which runs along those parts of the street. It's uh, what I call the Greenway activated street because the Greenway runs either next to the street, as in the picture of um, Milburney Road, or within the street, as in Roch Ford, I always have to remember, Drive. Uh, those streets, I believe, should mirror or mimic the Greenway. They're part of the Greenway, and they give the Greenway a certain identity when it passes out of the typical part of the Greenway, to another part that's not sharing a street. Uh, I think that can generally be done fairly easily. In fact, in both of these situations, there are uh, opportunities to make that happen at a, not a, a high price for development or in many cases, an improvement of the development. Both of them have their own peculiar uh, features. And the feature of uh, Mill Burney is that there's a large embankment that you see in the street uh, across from the Greenway that is really only 20 feet deep, but it gives about 30 feet of trees because it's at an angle like this. But, uh, excuse me, but that whole angle comes down to a very small s section. The other one on uh, uh, Ratchford Drive is a little more complicated, and it also involves the North Carolina DOT as well as the RDOT. So uh, I hope you'll have a look at those, and if you're interested in more information, I'll be glad to provide it. I think the opportunity there is to fill in a little gap on appearance of the Greenway. There's not room for everything, and I think the approach taken currently for the Greenway to move it along to greater and greater utility is the critical part. I mean, if you don't have a Greenway to begin with, there's no way to no reason to worry about how pretty it is. But I think pretty is an important part. And when I say pretty, it's a lot more involved in that, and I'm sure you would understand. Um, last word is, though, we've got to have a huge, overwhelming bond-favorable vote, because that 
bond issue, $275 million is just a down payment. Uh, there's a lot more to get. And with a good turnout and strong showing, we'll be in good shape. Regrettably, that's it for me. <laughs> Thanks. Mr. Johnson, thank you for joining us this evening. Again, on behalf of the Commission, we deeply appreciate your steadfast advocacy for our greenways and our parks and our community. Are there any questions from uh, the Commission? Hearing none, we'll proceed with our next guest. Thank you again, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Always. <laughs> I believe we have with us tonight for public comment a Mr. Corey Bates. Mr. Corey Bates, if you'll please proceed. Again, you've got three minutes yeah. at the podium. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair and Commission members. Um, uh, Corey Bates with 2309 Ridge Road. Ridge Road is really what I want to talk about tonight, uh, just briefly, really just to start a conversation. Um, if you may or may not know that Ridge Road uh, was in the early 80s was the first place in Raleigh to start bike lanes. And it was the leader at the time. And um, I would like to have kind of continue that conversation to make it even better than what it is now, not for just bicyclists, but also pedestrians. Um, as you'll see in the packet, there's only, I'll send an email with, uh, so everybody can see it later, but the roadway widths are very wide. Um, recently, they've been dropped from 35 to 30 miles per hour in, in order to try to help reduce speed, which it really hasn't um, done yet. Uh, hopefully it will. Um, but it's really a shoot off of the belt line when there's uh, backups or traffic jams on the belt line. And so uh, certain times of the day, it becomes kind of a racetrack through there. Um, what my proposal is, is to take some of these street widths. There's two street widths. Um, about two thirds of it is a 38 foot uh, curb to curb. The other uh, section is 44 feet curb to curb, which is really wide. It uh, has six foot bike lanes on each side. Um, and then it has 16 foot um, travel lanes uh, for autos. I'd love to see that at 10 or 11 feet for autos to really neck that down, help hopefully slow that down, but really just simply just add some more paint um, to get some buffered bike lanes in there. I think the buffering will help. There's been accidents uh, with pedestrians as of recent. Um, as of the summer, there was actually a person that got hit by a car um, on a bicycle in front of my house. And, um, and I've seen it happen a couple times. So this is really phase one of my plan. Phase two, I'll come back and talk about. But um, phase one is really just to make that safer. There are two schools. There's an elementary school on Ridge Road. There's a middle school on Ridge Road. Make it safer for them to get to school in the morning. Make it safer to get to the community pool. It's a Raleigh community pool on Ridge Road. And, um, and really just uh, make that a premier destination. Um, I'll, I'll close with. Um, I moved to Ridge Road because my wife was starting uh, to run marathons. And um, she, there's a house for sale. We were living in Mordecai at the time. We loved it. And she saw this house for sale. She's like, I don't even want to go in it. I just want to buy it because it's on Ridge Road. Believe it or not, because she could run. It's relatively flat. It's two miles. She can get some laps in. There's a Galloway program that, that trains for marathons on Ridge Road several nights a week. So there's lots of people to use that great place to learn how to ride and get used to bike lanes and how they should interact um, with um, so the, this is really some ideas but just wanted to kind of float that out there and, and get your support mr. Bates thank you so much for coming before the Commission sharing your thoughts and ideas as it relates to potential improvements along the Ridge Road corridor uh, I do have a quick question and this is kind of directed at staff you know, I feel like we've talked about Ridge Road before. Are there any improvements that you could speak to sort of in relation to uh, this comment from Mr. Bates? There are none that I am aware of. Um, however, and Mr. Bates, I do apologize. I do owe you an email. Um, but we are currently looking at what our next batch of standalone bike markings projects would be, and I don't think it's unreasonable to add this as a list to the list of ones to look at. 
Thank you, Ms. Burris. I mean, I certainly know there's a lot of development heading in your direction and lots of opportunity to make improvements along that corridor. So it's awesome to have this as an added consideration uh, as we look at that corridor. Uh, Ms. Gellenbeck? Yes, I'd, uh, thank you so much for bringing this to the um, commission. I agree, Ridge Road is a um, critical part of our network um, because uh, um, it is a very flat terrain, so it's incredibly easy to cycle to, but it also gives you access to the Greenway. So the, for example, you can get to the Museum of Art uh, using that uh, bike lane, you can get to a shopping center, you can get to a dentist, you can get to schools. Uh, like you mentioned, one park, the swimming pool, but it also gets you to Glen Road, which brings you to uh, another area of Raleigh. So this is a really important to me in infrastructure. And when I drive on that road, I saw the same thing. There was plenty of room. But what I also witnessed was uh, landscape services parked in the bike lane. And there's a sign that indicates no parking. So it's not being observed as an important network of our transportation system. And so by you bringing it to us today, it enables me to also share what I've witnessed uh, on that as well. So thank you. Thank you. And if you don't mind, um, I will say that the, the parking changes throughout at certain times. There's no parking. But I will say that um, it is everybody has driveways unlike a lot unlike some some other areas of the city and so really there is really no need other than landscape services or something like that to park in the street so um i would love to look at that as well as you know maybe maybe it we don't need parking on that road so much so we'll say that a neighborhood-led effort would probably have a lot more success to remove parking from that road if, if you have other neighbors that are like-minded it's uh it's no parking 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on that stretch, I think? I want to say that's right, yeah. How much parking do you see during the day, or is most of that parking happening in those off hours, or is it just kind of ignored and used? It's really zero parking during the day except for deliveries, and um, if there's, you know, I'm, I think my neighbor has a truck out there right now because he's having work done on his house. But other than that, there, you know, there really isn't. It's landscape crews that are there for short, short term. Yep, and what I witnessed was the landscape crews putting their orange, you know, sign that just says working's going to be done. They placed it on the bike lane. Yeah. When you're not this when it at a time when there's no parking available, and so it really forces the cyclist to enter into the travel lane, right? It, and because this is a major route, it connects communities. It goes to an elementary school. When I got to the elementary school, which is Lacey Elementary, there were bicycles that were parked and secured to their rack, so I know it's being used. Mr. Bates, thank you again. Unless there's any further question or comment from the commission? If I could just say one last thing. Yes, please. Um, I appreciate the comment about the access to the Greenway, which is phase two, which is what I'll come to you in the next, which is Glen Eden Drive, which is from Ridge to the Greenway. Um, which will create a beautiful loop all the way down to Wade Avenue. And I use that right now, but I have an 11-year-old, which I do not trust to go down Glen Eden right now. Mm -hmm. And actually, it has a crosswalk that ends up with no sidewalk. There's no sidewalk. There's no way. You have to go into somebody's yard, um, which is a scary situation around in Glen, Glen Eden and Ridge. So we'll talk about that in the future, but I appreciate that. I'm glad you mentioned it because I do want to add that also um, it that network, um, the, the Ridge Greenway takes you to Crabtree Mall, Crabtree Creek Mall, is it, or Crabtree Good Mall, on. which is, of course, a, a, an opportunity for employment for our teenagers uh, in the community. So I think that this is a really important piece of a uh, network for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Do we have any further public comment? Seeing and hearing none, we'll proceed with our presentations. Up first, we have uh, Dan Anderson, if he'll please proceed to the podium. Uh, as he does, I would like to share briefly, you know, the 2020s promised to be pivotal for urban mobility. While electric car models compete for the limelight in television commercials, <laughs> Active travel modes, such as walking and cycling, more quietly contribute their part to the transport revolution. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has been a powerful catalyst of change by allowing millions of people around the globe to experience different transport options. Given changed schedules, mobility needs, and traffic conditions, characterized by less traffic, less noise, and pollution, more dedicated space for pedestrians and cyclists, and streets as outdoor livable spaces. This has created an unprecedented window of opportunity for changes to be supported and sustained in the longer term, transforming the quality of urban life for the better and increasing societal resilience. My colleagues, this comes to us via the Ford to the walking and cycling, the latest evidence to support policymaking and practice, uh, a report by the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe. And this evening, we happen to have with us Dan Anderson, courtesy of the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences, a visiting scholar uh, this semester with NC State, uh, with whom I had the pleasure of uh, meeting a few weeks ago and have invited him to share with us some updates on walking, cycling, the benefits thereof to our health, wellness, social welfare, all of the above, uh, and of course our, our climate. Uh, Dan Anderson, please. Thank you. Should I stand over here? Yes, yeah. yes, thank you. And I should mention, each of you in your uh, online agenda packets have access to the full and complete 133-page report on policy and practice in uh, walking uh, and cycling infrastructure uh, that we'd love to see more of, of course, in our own city. Mr. Anderson? Thank you. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Nick and the Commission, for giving me this opportunity to, to say a few words about my research, um, mostly from a European perspective. And I will share some, some slides. Um, um, I will start with a um, historic uh, look in the historic uh, in the rear view mirror, a historic look back for uh, a few slides, and then I will move on to uh, my research area and finish with some uh, new uh, published research related to, to this area. Uh, we call it active commuting, walking and biking to work. But this is also applicable to, to walking and biking in general, of course. So please free, feel free to, to ask questions during my presentation or afterwards. I'll be happy to, to, to answer as best as I can to your questions. And as Nick said, I'm here for a few months at NC State as a visiting scholar um, from, from Stockholm, Sweden, uh, Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences. So, uh, just a few pictures here to, to get you in the right mood. Uh, this is from the, I think, the 1940s, uh, maybe the early 1950s in Stockholm, where pretty much everyone uh, took their bike or, or walked to work. And if we think about it, um, just for the last two, maybe three generations, pretty much everyone used uh, some kind of biological uh, commuting to, to get to and from work. But um, the, the car industry has been doing uh, great progress to, to change our uh, societies and it uh, has caused significant um, impacts on how we um, uh, plan our cities and I'll get back to that. This is just a graph showing the amount of cars, trucks and buses in Sweden and as you can see from, from World War II uh, there's been a huge expansion in the amount of uh, uh, motorized vehicles in, in, in Sweden. And Sweden is a small country. We have just about 10 million uh, people in the whole country. I know um, North Carolina is just about almost double that size, so it's a small country. But you can see that we are approaching uh, like five million uh, motorized vehicles uh, in our country uh, around the year uh, 2000 and so. So um, and nothing has really been done to, to examine how pedestrians and those who bike, how has that impacted their commute? with respect to, for example, speed, um, flow of traffic, exhaust fumes, and noise. 
And in our studies, we can see that there is a difference depending on what mode you're using, what is considered most disturbing or least disturbing. But it's a consensus that uh, the advent and uptake of motor vehicles has reshaped our cities in a most fundamental way, causing um, neighbors that used to be living relatively close to each other uh, with an easy access with a bike or by foot. Uh, depending on how we build our highways and so, it has been a huge change and it's become more uh, it's becoming harder and harder to, to access certain areas in the city. And with respect to active commuting, it's, um, the, the easy definition is walking and biking to work and maybe to, to, to school as well. It has several um, benefits um, besides the, the obvious benefits that it's related to individual health but also wide benefits to, to planetary health and societal health and even on local economy. And I'll get back to that later during my presentation. It, um, it's a way to, um, in, in, with respect to individual health, it's a great way to, to kind of squeeze into some kind of physical activity into a daily routine. And by doing so, we can expect to have lots of different benefits on, on our well-being. And this is, I, I'll skip that one, I'll go straight to this one. And all these slides are, some of them are from the pamphlet that uh, was sent to you, and some are my own slides. And I don't know if you're interested, but I'm happy to, to give them away after my presentation. You might also already have them, that's, that's okay. But, but if, if we look at it briefly, we can, we can see that we have three different effects on uh, benefits of walking on cycling. Uh, so there are the obvious uh, individual uh, effects uh, in blue here. We can see that um, uh, risks of getting non-communicable diseases like as cardiovascular disease, uh, certain forms of cancer, etc. Um, get reduced, lower risk of getting those diseases. It's also good for mental health, uh, fitness and strength and so forth. But also for the environment, you can see that it has uh, the power to reduce uh, carbon emissions and air pollution. And there's also a difference between walking and biking here due to difference in, in ventilation. When you bike, you have a higher ventilation, so maybe in some ways um, it can be more problematic with exhaust fumes when you bike compared to when you walk. But when you look at uh, health impact assessments, um, the benefits of physical activity are much larger uh, than the potential risks of biking in cities. There is a threshold, I think, for like five or six hours. If you bike for five or six hours in a highly congested uh, area with um, lots of exhaust fumes, that can be uh, potentially dangerous. But most of us are not commuting for five or six hours. So, And there's also, as you see in the... Um, Lower end uh, on the mobility side, there are some um, benefits there as well. So there is a huge benefit if the society can kind of have a multimodal view of uh, transportation um, in contrast to the car-centric paradigm. But in order to do so, we have to um, investigate how those who bike and those who walk are perceiving uh, their root environment. It's not enough just to look at um, levels of air pollution and particulate matters, um, levels of noise, etc. We have to ask people what do they think. So we have done quite a lot of that in, in Stockholm. Here's a picture from, from Stockholm. We have um, used a questionnaire, a survey, uh, called the ACRES, the Active Commuting Route Environment Scale, and I will describe that uh, briefly in just a minute. This is a model showing um, our um, uh, work. It's a, a model showing that uh, on the top, the first level, the top third, are showing the perceptions of the route environment. From the origin to the destination, we have different environmental domains, the physical, 
that's the existing object, like uh, trees and buildings, the traffic um, domain, moving objects, cars, other pedestrians, cyclists, etc. The social environment, how is the social environment? It's the interaction between individuals. We have uh, the weather um, that can, at least in Sweden, be very uh, tough uh, in the winter season with lots of snow and heavy rain and so. And we also have light conditions that can be uh, very important. And besides that, we also have other uh, dimensions as well that uh, is related to safety uh, at night, safety from crime, etc. So there are several aspects uh, affecting our, our commute. And how we, how we perceive these um, environmental domains are affecting our appraisals of whether or not we can um, determine if the, the environment is safe uh, or unsafe with, with respect to traffic, safe or unsafe with respect to uh, other reasons, for example crime, fear of uh, something to happen during the commute, but also if it's hindering or stimulating we have seen in our study that we can have people who bike and walk can be very safe uh, objectively with steel barriers and, and you know fences that are protecting them from traffic but due to extremely high levels of noise uh, it can be very hindering even though it's safe objectively so we have two different measures of that and all this can can affect then um, how our walking behavior with respect to route choice, duration, uh, frequency, and intensity. It can have effects on our health. For example, it can affect uh, blood pressure, risks of uh, certain diseases, as I mentioned earlier. And it can also affect our well-being. And um, we, are, we are talking about our environmental well-being during our commute. If we are experiencing a high environmental well-being, we are likely to commute and bike and walk more often. So it's, it's interesting and important to try to increase the well-being during the commute. There are several ways to do that, and I'll get back to that briefly in just a minute. So, um, I have a pointer here. You see that... Um, doesn't work very well but as you see we have a, a tool called acres active commuting route environment scale which is a complement to many of the other walking tools you might have heard of other tools like the news or twin cities uh, walking scale there are lots of surveys that are examining the environment but most of them are just examining the environment close to where people are residing maybe 10 or 15 minutes from, from, where, uh, from one's dwelling. The commute, especially those who bike, they can commute to maybe two or three or four, five different environments on, en route to, to the work from their home place. So, so there's a need to, to kind of in-depth investigate how, the, how those who commute for further distances perceive their, their uh, commuting route. I won't, go, I won't go into detail in this, and this is just the questions, um, the pedestrian version of the acres. It deals with a few questions re relating to, to motor, motorized traffic, as you see, exhaust fume, noise, flow of vehicles, etc. Congestion levels, uh, conflicts, um, unsafety, safety, uh, greenery, uh, aesthetics, which is very important. Um, aesthetics matter, uh, and matters a lot, actually. And I'll get back to that. And one reason is that aesthetics is related to slower uh, driving behavior. When you have a beautiful environment, people are driving more slowly. And that increases safety. So aesthetics matter. And there are some other questions as well. So, um, and in our studies, uh, we have a using 15 scales, uh, 15 steps in the scale. Um, two different uh, adjectives, very low or very high. And the respondent is supposed to encircle the figure that matches his or her experience. And sometimes we have those who bike for, for in different areas, and we have different 
the, the, the setting is very different in the inner urban area in Stockholm compared to the outer uh, suburban, more rural area. But sometimes people are biking for 40, 50 kilometers to work, uh, so they can experience both settings. But these uh, scales, uh, the, the possibility to, to measure perceptions and capture that in, in metrics or in number enables us to kind of uh, measure um, the, the importance of different variables, such as, for example, greenery or exhaust fumes. And we can see how that relates to um, whether or not the, the environment is hindering or stimulating or uh, related to traffic unsafety or safety. And I'll show you just a few slides here. This is a slide from uh, uh, roughly a thousand uh, uh, people who bike to work on a regular basis, uh, roughly 50% men, 50% women, uh, from, from different areas in Stockholm, um, commuting to work. Uh, and you can see that the perception of greenery along the commuting route is very um, strongly related to uh, if um, those who bike are uh, viewing or appraising the environment as uh, hindering or stimulating. The more greenery there is along the route, the more uh, stimulating uh, the commute is. And this is also true for um, another variable, uh, exhaust fumes. As you can see here, very high levels of exhaust fumes is um, related to a more uh, hindering environment, especially for for those who, who bike, uh, not as a strong relationship with those who walk, and that is probably related to those who are uh, cycling are closer to the traffic and they are breathing uh, in a different pattern. With respect to, to walking, this is um, an example of um, one of our results uh, from the inner urban area of Stockholm. You can see there are some basic variables and some intermediate outcomes uh, that are built up of more basic variables. You, we can see that flow of motor vehicles and speeds of motor vehicles are causing noise. And this is for pedestrians and the noise uh, are perceived as hindering the dashed line or uh, a line that is, has a negative relation in uh, multiple regression analysis. And the dotted lines and the uh, other line, although to the left, bottom left, they're, they're showing other things. But as you can see, noise is perceived as um, uh, very hindering. And noise also, if you follow the line to, to the left-hand side, you can also see that noise has uh, a relation to conflicts. Uh, and conflict has a relation to making the environment less safe. So... Um, Greenery and aesthetics are uh, positively related to, to a hindering and safe environment. More greenery uh, is uh, appra um, appraised as uh, something that is very stimulating. And more aesthetics is also perceived as something that is uh, very stimulating and also related to, to safety. And it has been shown in, by different researchers in different parts of the world that uh, if you have a beautiful environment, um, people are enjoying it and people on, on the motorized vehicles are driving more slowly. So it's, it's something to think of that uh, it's not beautiful just for, for those who walk and bike, it can also um, affect uh, the, the whole traffic environment. Okay. Uh, This is a picture from Raleigh, uh, close to Oakwood Cemetery, uh, very close to uh, um, uh, Brookside Bodega, Brookside Drive. Some of you know where I am. And um, we, can, we can decide in many ways how we want to, to design uh, our, our environment. If we are interested in uh, designing a environment to, to, um, that is designed for cars or motorized vehicles, or we can decide if we want to focus on uh, 
transporting people instead. And we can probably manage both, I think. I think. You know, if we can travel to the moon and back, we can do something good for, for those who are living in our city. And, but this is just a picture showing that uh, a lack of pavement, which is causing uh, insecurity and a fear of walking. And that holds people back from um, getting their daily form of physical activity due to insecurity. So pavements is something that is very important uh, for security, uh, at least for pedestrians, but also for uh, those who bike with bike lanes. And this is a picture from, from Stockholm. We have a lot of problems in Stockholm as well, but I just want to show you that here is an probably better way to organize the active commuting. You have a, a broad pavement, you have a bike lane, and you have some uh, things that are traffic calming for buses and cars. Another thing that I just want to mention briefly is that higher levels of greenery or green spaces are associated with more people walking and biking. And that is um, uh, true for uh, pretty much every country in the world that more greenery is causing more people to walk and bike. And there are several reasons for this. There are different uh, theories. Maybe you heard of the, the biophilia hy hypothesis by Wilson and there are other um, Kaplan and Kaplan um, psychologists that are there, so there are reasons for people liking greenery and, and just, uh, just want to compare this picture this is a picture from a park close to uh, our uh, school back in Sweden uh, uh, called the Humlegårds Parken Swedish pronunciation and uh, lots of old trees uh, beautiful statues people are walking and they're barbecuing and so so but what happens if we decide to to take away the um, trees so this is a photoshopped picture so they didn't actually cut the trees down but you can see the difference in uh, in the environment uh, what the greenery does uh, the greenery kind of makes us want to be there or be a part there, it, it senses some kind of, yeah, it, it calls for us in some way to, to, to be there and maybe feel some kind of positive effect on our mood and so forth. But um, the, 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 the park without the trees is not just uh, the same. So I'll just have a few more slides. So it's, it's, it's very, very important for for all of us, like if you look at the hier hierarchy of those who walk and bike, uh, traffic safety is on top. It's very important that we have a safe environment. But sometimes, depending on where you live and where you are in life and who you are visiting, people <coughs> will walk and they will bike despite reasons for um, reasons of safety but we know that traffic safety if we prior prioritize that people will uh, bike and they will uh, walk more and as i mentioned briefly if we have those um, walking and cycling friendly street designs they result in uh, in a traffic calming environment um, and it this this picture is from a small street in in denmark uh, and in Denmark, about 60% of all the, tra all the trips to work are made by bicycle. So 60% of all the uh, travels to and from work are made by bicycle. That's the fastest way to get from A to B in, in Copenhagen, for example, where, where um, the cyclists have a lot of power. Uh, people have to stop for them, otherwise uh, it'll be a um, disaster in, in the city. And interesting, you can see people biking in, in suits and so in, uh, in Copenhagen. Maybe you've been there, it's interesting to see. Anyway, uh, just finishing up here with my last slide, or um, maybe that one more slide after this. Um, there's a consensus that um, traffic safety, if you work um, extensively with traffic safety during how to design uh, networks and regular traffic and uh, protect uh, vulnerable road users like the elderly and uh, children, for example. It has a clear effect on how much people um, walk and bike. So if you compare crash rates to um, 20 or 30 different European countries, 
you can see that levels of active travel demonstrate the strong, there's a strong relation between uh, safety and higher levels of walking and cycling. So, um, just to sum up, um, this has been a brief um, talk about uh, some of uh, my research and our research group and a few um, uh, facts about um, new research uh, that has been um, delivered mainly um, in the scientific community and um, very well um, put in together in the document you sent. It's quite an extensive document, but it's uh, worth reading. It, it's made in Europe, but can be implied in North America and South America as well. It's okay to steal good ideas. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for joining us tonight. You know, this commission and its members oftentimes will cite the benefits of mm. uh, investing, you know, our public's resources in improving our cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. But I suspect that it means a great deal to the commission to hear from a scholar who's actively engaged in current research and work that supports our policymaking apparatus here in the city of Raleigh. Are there any questions from our commission members? I, I imagine perhaps Mr. Thomas would uh, be willing to acknowledge how much of this uh, research and work, especially as it relates to the root environment, is very much in line with comments and observations with regard to the Hillsborough Street corridor, especially as we get closer and closer to campus, where we have certainly plenty of uh, cyclists who would probably like to make use of the Hillsborough Street uh, stretch, but because of that route environment, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. feel somewhat discouraged. Right, right, yeah. Um, I was going to talk about this later in our, our general commission comments, but um, uh, yeah, I am very concerned about the Hillsborough Street bike lanes, and I think we would see, uh, you know, an explosion of, of biking in that corridor if the environment was, you know, people appraised it as being safer in, in all of the, the categories that you described. Mm. Um, and, and I would also say that y early on you mentioned resilience, and, and I think back to the earlier days of the pandemic, and I, I thought, well, what if this had occurred prior to Zoom or other video conferencing technologies? Mm. You know, what would be, how would we have gotten by? You know, what would happen if suddenly there, there was no, uh, you know, the gas pumps all turned off? Electric cars aren't going to save us overnight, you, you know. So just thinking about resilience as well, I think, is a key thing to keep in mind for us mm. here. The, the electric cars are great in many ways, but if you, um, if you exceed... Uh, 50 kilometers an hour, the, the sound, the noise is exactly the same, but, but it, it can be very good um, in regarding uh, different uh, exhaust fumes and uh, carbon dioxide and so forth, but um, it will also lead to other challenges as well. They won't solve anything. L just look at the, the amount of space an electric vehicle demands compared to a traditional car, the same amount. So we still we still have a lot of problems with to fit in uh, all the cars. Uh, yep, Ms. Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank you. I'd like to piggyback off of uh, Commissioner Thomas's comments about Hillsborough Street. Um, that got a major uh, renovation about ten years ago with the roundabouts, and yep. then the the bike lanes were put in, and the painting is fading. And the bike lanes were located in the car door zones. Okay. And so I was wanting to know if you've done any research in, I don't know if this is the right term, but designating a street as a bikeway, which I've seen in Amsterdam, yeah. that a road went from prioritizing car vehicles to prioritizing bike riders, and the Vehicle drivers were guests of the space. Yeah. We, we have a few of those in, 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 uh, in Sweden as well. But um, in Holland, uh, Netherlands, Amsterdam, uh, they're pretty much everywhere where, um, where cars are considered as, as guests uh, on the street. And um, 
We haven't done any research about that in Stockholm, but international research uh, points in the direction that the traffic uh, environment is, is, is safer and reduces accidents uh, and so forth. But unfortunately, we haven't done anything in, in, in Sweden, but the, right. the scientific um, evidence backs up those um, if you work that way. That impact of yeah, change yeah, in behavior yeah, yeah. of this coexisting between multiple modes of transportation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Increasing safety along yeah. I have another question, Commissioner. May I jump? Go ahead. In your research, did you, uh, this is outside of the physical um, transportation uh, um, infrastructure, did you explore, uh, do you have uh, driving laws? that impact um, the driver's behavior towards other road users. Um, so that um, when somebody is driving their vehicle, they have a mindset of responsibility. Um, and, it, and if they, they cause a crash, there will be high penalties for that. Yes, yes we do, yeah. And do you think that impacts also um, this relationship between drivers and other road users. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that um, in um, in s s some some European cities, but not all, there are so many cyclists. There are cyclists everywhere. So you have to be very careful when you're driving a car, and you are very careful not to hit anyone. And um, I feel when I bike from Oakwood to to NC State. I feel that I'm very alone as a cyclist, and when I'm alone, I'm an uh, I'm something strange in the in the traffic uh, environment mm. in the streetscape, and I'm not um, there is there is not um, I think if if we can increase the people on on bikes, um, that'll be a much safer environment because people will be more used to people are not used to sharing the streets here as compared to in Stockholm, where everyone shares it more equally. Thank you. Any further questions? We have Ms. Stern. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. I really enjoyed it. And if you are working with state students this semester, we'd love, I would love to see kind of what they come up with, any ideas this generates. I thought it was really great. Thank you. Yeah, we, I have having a few lectures and we will continue working. I'm working with my contact here is um, Professor Aaron Hip, um, Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management Center for, I think, Geospatial Analytics. I'm not really sure what that means, but sounds nice. <laughs> but yeah, we are school, doing some, some work with that. And I will continue work. And there's quite a lot of interest from the students as well. So that's interesting. We have to aim for uh, empowerment and education. And we're right there with you, yep. Mr. Anderson. Yep. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank uh, you. Deeply appreciate having you with us tonight, having you here with us in the city of Raleigh, mm -hmm. visiting all the way from Stockholm. Sweden. And what a beautiful city you have. Thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for having the opportunity to speak here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving along, up next we have Miss Lisa Schiffbauer here to present on the Parks Bond. As she comes up and prepares to present, I do want to mention one last time that again, your online agenda packets, which are available to the public, include access to this World Health Organization report on walking and cycling. It's broken up into four sections. Uh, first chapter on the latest trends and policies around urban mobility and transport. A second chapter exploring transport policy and planning uh, practice that argues for a modern evidence-based approach to promoting walking and cycling. A third chapter that provides uh, additional scientific evidence explaining why walking and cycling should be promoted. And last but not least, a final chapter that presents an overview of measures and policies for the promotion of walking and cycling. I hope this serves, and this was published in June 2022. I hope that this uh, 100 plus page uh, booklet uh, report serves as uh, evidence and additional, uh, let's say, uh, you know, um, uh, support for you and your arguments for a better, improved cycling uh, and pedestrian environment for uh, our residents here in the city of Raleigh. 
Up next, Ms. Lisa Schiffbauer in the Parks Bond. Good evening. As Nick mentioned, um, my name is Lisa Schiffbauer. I am a senior engineering supervisor for Raleigh Parks. I manage primarily the capital improvement projects for Greenway. And so I oversee the long range planning, the implementation of projects, and then also uh, some of the construction projects. So I'm here tonight to um, introduce to you the Parks Bond projects and go through a series of slides. And so on November 8th of this year, Raleigh voters will be asked to consider a $250, $275 million bond referendum. The Parks Bond includes projects that continue to pr provide Raleigh, the Raleigh community with healthy park and recreation opportunities for everyone to enjoy. And the proposal focuses on heightened community priorities that have emerged as a result of the city's focus on social equity and the, in, and the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have seen a dramatic increase of um, usage along our Greenway Trail, for example. We have trail counters throughout the system and we were able to collect the data that over 300% more usage of Greenway trails. And so the vision is to provide improved, equitable, resilient park and greenway access across the city of Raleigh. And so we have listed here some previous bar park. I don't know why I can't say the word park. I guess I've been saying it so many times today. Um, previous park bond referendums, 2014, 91.775, 2007, um, prior to that was 88. 2003, so you can see the increase of, of the, the dollars um, that have been you know, added to park bond referendums over the years. This is a all-inclusive list of the projects. There are 21 projects altogether. They include anything from a master plan implementation, um, through a carrying out implementation of a master plan through all phases, and then several greenway projects. I know you're probably interested in a lot of the greenway projects, um, but I'm gonna cover all the projects. Um, so this is sort of a, a map that shows geographically um, where those projects are located. In your brochure that I handed out, there's a bit more detail um, you have, uh, and this can also be found online, this brochure as well. Um, if you just go to Raleigh's home site and type in Parks Bond, at the bottom of that page, it'll be a resource link, and it'll have this in English and Spanish. <clears throat> so I'll start with the big branch Greenway connector. Um, it's called a connector here, but it's really, um, a traditional uh, greenway trail. And in each of these categor categories you'll see, um, or each of the projects listed, you'll see what council district um, that is located in. Uh, the Big Branch Greenway, um, and what you'll see on the next slide is the Marsh Creek Greenway. Those are both generally in the same geographic location it's actually the bubble that's to the right of the, the um, red alignment. But the big branch is four and a half plus or minus um, from Crabtree Creek all the way up to Sandy Forks Road and connects several parks along the way. Lake Lynn, so the bond also includes some reinvestment into our system, the Lake Lynn Trail. Uh, the east side of Lake Lynn was included in the 2014 bond and so because of escalation of prices, we weren't able to include the entire loop. Lake Lynn East Loop is being paved right now, so the Lake, Loom, Lake Lynn West side of the trail is included in the proposed um, Parks Bond referendum. And here you can see Marsh Creek, what I was talking to, you, what I mentioned on the other side, it's six plus or minus um, miles, it's a new trail, 
from Crabtree, Crabtree Creek to Spring Forest Road. It connects Brentwood Park and Hill Street Park. <clears throat> Mine Creek Greenway improvements. So it's an existing greenway. Um, this is the section of greenway that's south of Shelley Lake. Um, it's one of the older sections of our greenway. And so this improvement would, um, this project would in, include improvements that would resurface, uh, redo grading, drainage, new pipes, um, potentially widening the trail to a wider width, um, replacing any other uh, bridge, boardwalk infrastructure um, that would need to be replaced. <clears throat> Walnut Creek, these, this again is like the Mine Creek, existing trail, making improvements. As you know, a lot of the Walnut Creek is in floodplain. So with this project, we're gonna be looking at having a more resilient greenway, maybe a little bit outside the floodplain, trying to balance, um, making sure that the areas that may flood, we have opportunity to have detours during those times. And we're gonna be looking a lot at connectivity from neighborhoods as part of these projects. So it's real important that we're looking at all the opportunities to connect um, neighborhoods to these projects, to these corridors that may not currently have that access. And so that's a good segue into the neighborhood and community connections. Um, proposed five million, this is citywide. We have not selected which projects those would be, but we have a, a lot of good candidates right now. Biltmore Hills tennis improvements, new tennis courts, and improving accessibility. Devereux Meadows, um, a lot of you may have heard recently some presentations on this particular project. Um, this would be implementation of the first phase. Um, here is the list of scope that would be part of that project. <clears throat> You're also very familiar with Dorothea Dix Park, probably, and the Gibson Play Plaza. So this is um, a, a project that would include construction of the Gibson Play Plaza. And listed here some other improvements. And this, too, would include leveraging 20 million in private donations. And I think you'll also probably be very interested in the Lake Wheeler Road and multi-use path improvements. It's proposed 21 million, um, with um, including a multi-use bike pet path, new park entrances at the park edge, and this is from South Saunders Street to Maywood Avenue. Aaronsbrook, <clears throat> this is a new park um, with adopted master plan, and so we'd be looking at um, these elements to include into that project. Green Road Park, um, site accessibility enhancement, um, improving, improving park amenities, including a comfort station, picnic shelter, and activity plaza. Uh, John Chavis Memorial Park, um, this is also a priority of um, the implementation of pro projects. Um, and this would be carrying out the remaining implementation of uh, the John Chavis um, master plan. South Park Heritage Walk and Top Green Center improvements. Um, <clears throat> I've recently see, seen some presentations on the South Park Heritage Walk project, and so um, this this is this would be I think it's a two and a, two and a half mile um, loop that would be connecting um, uh, a, a heritage walk of of, a, of historic sites and then also including John Top Green Center renovation and expansion. Kyle Drive Master Plan, this is, this would be a new park, so this would be implementation of that, of that master plan. Uh, Noose River Park, this is also, um, would be a, a, a new addition to our inventory of, of parks. Um, and this would be um, also a master plan. Method community center improvements, community center renovation of the Pioneers Field, and the, I'm sorry, community center renovation, and then a renovation of the Pioneers Building, which um, is a, uh, a, 
I don't know if it has a historical, um, uh, I don't know if it has a historical nature, but it's an agricultural building. That's what I was thinking. It's the agricultural building um, within, within the park. And then Sertoma Art Center improvements. This would be a renovation and expansion, and then some site improvements as well. And the list continues, and Strickland and Leesville Road park improvements. Um, a lot of these are projects that are either renovating the center, adding amenities, um, renovating restroom facilities, and you can see the list of improvements recommended here. Um, Tarboro Community Center. And then, you know, this is the very last side. But uh, the property tax impact, this has been a question um, that a lot of people have asked. And um, so we've included this in the information. It's also included in the brochure. But four pennies per 100 assessed property tax value. So the medium home assessed tax value being 256000 That tax impact for that median home value is $103 annual increase in taxes. So we have a lot of information on the website. <clears throat> uh, all you have to do is go to the website, type in Parks Bond. The website comes up. There's an interactive map, um, very much interactive, and you can zoom in on those particular project areas. Uh, if you have any questions specifically, this is the email to use, this is the phone number to use, and then we'll get that directed to the appropriate person. So with that, I'll take any questions. Ms. Schiffbauer, thank you so much for this presentation on the 2022 Parks Bond uh, and the investments we're looking to make in our parks and greenways and community centers all across the city of Raleigh. Um, I do have one question just briefly about Noose River Park, yes, uh, which is a proposed new park and you know it looks like the money here would support uh, the master plan development community engagement. Uh, it's a question specifically about the size, roughly, the, the acreage. Do you happen to know how large of a park we're talking for Noose River? I do not, but I can get that and get back to you. Um, that's a good question. Typically with um, the acreage, um, it's usually whatever we acquired and then, you know, depending on what is, uh, developable. So I could probably get you the acreage of the entire lot and then not knowing until we've master planned it, what is actual usable area. Understood. Thank you. Um, any questions from the commission? Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Sure. Um, the the number, the dollar value is very large, yes. <laughs> and um, so I'm wondering. I I noted how you identified some of the plans for like the master plan, and um, I'm, I'm, I, what does that mean? I, I, it, along this list, is is that money going to be divided up? It's not going to be divided up per. I mean, how how is it going to be? Sure. So used? let me take an example of the Noose River Park, and so that is um, eleven point five mil million. And so what they'll do is that that funding will most likely. So it's a rollout between of six years. So these aren't projects that are all going to be done the very first year. So after, when, if the bond passes, council will then decide how we're gonna roll out those pro projects. And it will be priority based. And so I think potentially the council has an idea of what they would want to roll out first. Um, so the way that we would do it is they would release the funding for, for example, like the, the New River Park. They would release the funding probably in the first year for to do the professional services related item of doing the public engagement and also doing the master plan. That's not gonna be $11.5 million worth. So they'll do the professional services part. And then 
However, the master plan ends up most likely with different phases. They will then allocate funding for implementation of that master plan based on the cost estimates that are prepared. So with the master plan, we'll do some really preliminary estimates on how much it would cost to build first phase, second phase. And then based on that, we can move into construction plans for implementation of that first phase. And so the next year, so if you did the master plan first, that would probably take a year. And then you may have a year of actually doing construction detailed drawings that you could give to a contractor. And then say the third year would be construction. So that project would most likely roll out over three years. And so the funding allocated would be to that specific um, scope of work. Okay. So um, of the 200 plus million dollars with the list that we have, we're anticipating results in six years? Yes. So it would be a rollout of six years of spending the total 275 million. For these projects? Yes. And do you believe that our city has the staff and capacity to well, manage that? With this bond is included um, additional resources to help carry out those projects. Mm -hmm. Now, will that still be enough? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, Kenneth? So I guess one point of clarification, Commissioner Gellenbeck, with mm -hmm. the, the six years that Lisa references, so that is the timeline with which the city has to essentially take out the debt against the bond. So the actual implementation will extend beyond that six years. But that's, the, that's that initial timeline just for, all, for the debt to be taken out by law. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, yeah. yeah. so more clarification. So we might have a project in, in year five because it, this is tied to the five-year CIP. And so, so you might have a project in that fifth year, so say 2027, 20, um, that won't be completed that year. I mean, you're going to implement it that year, mm -hmm. but not going to be completed that year. Mm -hmm. So implementation of those um, would hopefully, I think goal would be six years. Um, we have the, the 2014 bond where we say, well, we're just finishing, it's 2022. So we're just now finishing up those projects. Mm -hmm. So to get a little bit of a idea. And just as a, I want to reaffirm what I heard earlier in your presentation, that we have seen as a city over the last, I guess, two, three years, an uptick in use of our parks uh, and greenways by about 300%. Did I hear that number correctly? Yes, the, gr the greenways I know for sure is a 300%. Individual parks, I know they, some of them have counters, but I don't, I'm, I'm sure different parks have different usage. Understood, thank you. And then in terms of how these 20 plus projects have been identified uh, by park staff, planning staff working with the parks board, um, effectively, you know, equity uh, and, and effectively equity considerations uh, yes. have been sort of at the lead um, sort of point of concern as it relates to how we can, you know, reinvest, uh, restore, um, renovate, or in fact expand access to new parks, right, across the city. Um, you know, I just in, in hearing that, that's deeply appreciated. You know, again, equity being a top concern, um, sort of in identifying the projects um, to invest in. I think that means yeah, a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was a statement that there was no question in there, was there? <laughs> that is uh, correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, you're welcome to elaborate on how equity was taken into consideration, um, if you're prepared to do so. But uh, yeah, there's, there's sure. So I mean, I, I'm because I'm the 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 Greenway Greenway person, and looking at the equity there, you can see on this map where the the dark, you know, green line is is where we have um, existing Greenway, and you have this area 
of um, just you know north of the the 440 or north of the Crabtree Creek Greenway where you know there isn't any access to and so that was that's a big gap within our system um, and then also whenever we did the Greenway master plan so we looked at prioritizing Greenway projects as part of that and we used we use social equity as part a component of prioritizing future extensions of the greenway system and we used other factors too um, but social equity being really number one and we looked at potential like future growth of areas where the future growth was going to be and we scored everything and so you know whatever project had the highest points that became you know the project that was number one and the big branch corridor which is um, the one right here this scored as the very number one project out of you know all the extensions now what we didn't prioritize as part of the greenway <coughs> master plan was reinvestment but we are going through a process with a consultant now to look at how we spend our annual CIP funds, the penny for parks funds. And it's a, that's a very, very much a smaller pot of money. But, um, and again, you'll see the social equity component as the number one priority um, in that process too. Thank you, Ms. Schiffbauer. I would like to say that I've had the um, pleasure and privilege of visiting uh, a number of these park projects, which I'll mention later during uh, the chair's report. But uh, in visiting a number of these over recent uh, weeks and months, it's been a lot to me to see all of these parks and uh, projects um, in very, very, very active use from people of all walks of life, you know, black, white, brown, all ages. I mean, it's remarkable. And, you know, we just had this presentation by our visiting scholar from Sweden uh, speak to, in very clear and certain terms, how access to our public green spaces, right, does a body good, uh, does a mind good. And it just, I think it's a real um, opportunity uh, for this city to um, reinvest, right, in its people through its public parks and public greens. So. Unless there's any further question from our commission, I see Mr. Otwell. I do have a couple questions. Apologize. Um, to go back to the Big Branch Trail, that would require a flyover and transportations cooperation to get a bridge over the Beltline. Mr. Yes. Ritchie, you wouldn't happen to know if there's been any movement on that, or uh, can you elaborate on that? Has there been any coordination? And I imagine that these funds don't go to pay for that. That's gigantic right. automobile road because that wouldn't even really pay for like the surface on that that's bridge. Right. That's right. So definitely coordination. Um, and, and, you know, once we go through a evaluation of alignment to opportunities um, for, for the big branch, so this funding does not include that bridge over, over 440. Um, and so there will be coordination. I don't know if the projects will, um, our funding for both will align um, within our rollout, but when we consider how the projects are gonna roll out um, from the bond, we'll be coordinating with transportation to see where they are in that process to see how we can better align potentially even a um, professional services for that. Um, but I would say if there's any reason that they would have to be independent, we would be looking at potentially an interim connectivity solution until we're able to provide more of a, a, a an ultimate um, connection of the big branch. And I had a couple technical questions about the loan. How? What's the length of the term for the loan? Is that information that I could look up somewhere else? Yeah. And take this so um, the length of that, I believe. Um, let's see. I have <coughs> that. Um, it's it's typically twenty years in which the municipality pledges to 
um, use its taxing power to repay that debt. And is the interest rate, would that be set at the time the bond would be passed? Is that set now? Or are we kind of looking at these interest rates and hoping that it works out for us as they go up? So the um, each year, I know the city council considers sets and adopts the city's tax rate on okay. an annual basis. Is that the interest rate? The tax rate is tied to the, like the tax rate that we take on the debt. I'm sorry, not the tax rate, the interest rate on the debt. Is that like commercial level interest? Do we get a different interest rate as the city and is that determined? That I don't know. I can look yeah. that up, thank you. Yeah, I don't know, we can get that information. I can find <laughs> that, thank you, I'm curious. <laughs> That's above my, my head, <laughs> I'm sorry. Ms. Gillenbeck? Yes, thank you, um, Commissioner Neptune. What if it doesn't pass? Yeah, so the good question, um, if it doesn't pass, then what we'll do is we'll most likely work with city manager's office and the city council on other alternatives for how to uh, implement the priorities. So most likely we'll be taking a look at the list, what is the biggest priority. Um, typically too, how that goes is like, what is the lowest hanging fruit? What can we accomplish mm. you know, uh, right away with the CIP funds? So. Uh, for example, the Lake Lynn repaving project. Potentially, if it if that project didn't pass in the bond, um, then we would potentially look at the penny for parks. Um, another way to leverage funding, um, grant opportunities, because if you can supply, you know, typically a, a percentage, 50-50, 80-20 grant opportunities, if you can if the city can leverage a portion of those funds, a lot of times there's there's funds out there. Now I know like with um, like Greenway projects, um, there's a lot more funding that is available to support those. Park projects, not as much. Um, but the answer to your question is that that is gonna have to go to city council and they're gonna have to evaluate what are the priorities and then how we um, prioritize the projects that we've listed as priorities and then how we get that done from a from a um, funding perspective mm -hmm. um, is to be determined right my understanding is the we alternate the bonds like the transportation bond was in 2016 if I remember correctly or 2017 was the last transportation bond right and so then then now we're doing the parks bond and we'll probably revisit transportation bond we don't it seems that we don't do it all at the same time and so we could be looking at a couple years out before we even approach this if it doesn't pass by the voters this time yes yes um, I, I'm not sure when um, that is a good question and I can I can um, ask others if it doesn't pass I don't know when the next opportunity for Mm -hmm. a bond. I don't know if it would be next year or if they would wait another two years um, or another five. I don't think they, they would wait that long. Um, but I can find out But that's a good question. That The, the answers that we have prepared for that question um, is, is really just working with city council to explore other options. And so that could be another option is to potentially put another parks bond out next year. It would be a council decision ultimately. Yes. If it did not pass, yes, council could determine or decide to put it back on the ballot Absolutely. You know, for an upcoming election cycle. Um, but now the bond approach, is is it fair to say that's the lowest cost approach for the taxpayer in terms of making the investment that we're seeking? From the information that I know and I'm aware of, that is the, the, the cheapest approach to pay for these types of projects. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Just a real quick question. Uh, your FAQ document mentions bonds going back to 1995, and I'm just curious if there has been a bond referendum since then that hasn't passed. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I Do you know? I don't think. I think uh, they've all passed. Yeah, our understanding is, I mean, I think as far as I've heard, and I believe this goes back to maybe the late 1980s, that no, there has never been a bond referendum in this field. Okay, thank you. We all still need to vote, but uh, just. You know. Well, I, I just, 
<laughs> I think it, it, you, when you look at the the dollar value on those bonds, it it so significantly jumps with this presentation from the previous ones, previous years. I, I, I am. I wish you well. I hope it works. It, it, it's a little scary. <laughs> it is, but I think we've. I, I like having these resources to share with community I, groups. And I'll it, do my it, best. You know, well, I will too. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all will. Yeah. And you know, it's in part a reflection of the tremendous growth that uh, our city and our community has experienced. Uh, you know, I think that uh, with this coming uh, election cycle, we are looking at a number of bond packages to reinvest, uh, not only in our parks and greenways and community centers and playgrounds, but you know, we're looking to invest in you know whole neighborhoods and communities through reinvestments in our Wake County public schools. Uh, and uh, Wake Tech. Uh, and so it, it's really a matter of determining as a community, as a city, whether or not uh, we're prepared to make that investment. I'd like to think that um, we are, but you know, it is true that uh, we are living through um, some pretty remarkable uh, <coughs> economic times. Uh, that said, I did have a conversation, I'll mention this briefly, and Ms. Schiffbauer, I really appreciate you being here with us tonight to share, you know, the facts and the information with this upcoming Parks Bond. Um, I'll sh briefly share, I had this conversation with uh, some students uh, at NC State who are working on a Get Out the Vote campaign geared toward the 18 to 25 year old cohort, and we were talking about the Parks Bond and we were kind of breaking it down, and they said, you know, uh, Mr. Neptune, you know, we're looking at the numbers here, and it appears to us that this uh, $103 sort of annual increase uh, for, you know, the, the homeowners, the taxpayers, that works out roughly to be about 8 or $9 a month. Well, I pay more than 8 or $9 a month for my Netflix subscription. <laughs> you know, I pay more, for, more than 8 and $9 a month for Hulu uh, and Spotify. I think I will subscribe to our parks and our greenways and sign us up. I mean, the, the kids, they, they're just so full of good energy. And I hope that um, we could find it within ourselves to channel such similar energy to reinvest back in our communities and neighborhoods across our growing city. Uh, with that, if there are no further questions from Ms. Schiffbauer, I believe we have uh, Ann Conlon next, uh, ready and prepared to join us. Ms. Schiffbauer? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. you very much. Ms. Uh, Ms. Conlon, I believe, is prepared to share with us an update on our sidewalk petition program. Mm. Uh, very excited. I know we have some uh, members here of the commission who are particularly interested in, in sidewalk petitioning oh. and anything we can do to make that program and process uh, better, more equitable, uh, and just more effective, I think, all the way around. So, Ms. Conlon. Great. Uh, good evening. I am uh, Ann Conlon, a senior transportation planner in our mobility strategy and infrastructure division transportation. As you said, uh, this presentation is really to tell you about the evaluation that's underway of the, the petition program focused on equity. Uh, we are looking at, uh, to the extent that that program is equitable and, and areas where it needs reform, it's uh, a direct, a strategic plan initiative that I am co-leading uh, with Leticia Holmes in our planning and development department. So I'll very briefly remind you how the petition program fits into the overall sidewalk program, tell you a little bit about uh, the origins of this evaluation in the strategic plan, and really I'm here looking for any feedback and guidance you all have to, to our next steps. We're working towards some community engagement, so we wanted to touch base with you and um, make sure we're on that right track and get any guidance that you have to give us. So, very briefly, we, we program and fund sidewalks in a variety of ways in the city. Uh, within kind of city programmed sidewalks, some come directly out of the pedestrian plan that is adopted and primarily identifies needs on major corridors around the city. There are several other buckets, but then another kind of key bucket is the petition process. So those are resident requested petition sidewalks. So I, we can kind of think about those two different different ways of generating projects. Of course, DOT projects include sidewalks more recently, funded increasingly by DOT, which is great, and also through city municipal agreements. And a lot of sidewalks get done with private development. 
So as I, I think you're all aware, the petition program has been on hold, uh, been suspended since 2020. There was some reform to the program a few years before that that released a lot of petitions. And uh, frankly, the city didn't have the resources to, to get those all delivered. And so there, it was suspended to try to work through that backlog. Um, and now we're kind of at the point where um, this is a timely review of the program so that before we restart it, we're sure that it's an equitable process that we're using. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are some unfunded petitions outstanding from the, the previous program, and, and council is working on trying to clear out that backlog as well. I want to just give you a sense of how many of the sidewalks that are built in the city are from petitions versus from those pedestrian plan identified sidewalks. So looking over the, the five years through 2021, uh, the chart on the right shows you all of those summed up. It's pretty close. We're, we're delivering a lot of petition driven sidewalks um, along with those, those other projects. And so again, it's critical that we're selecting those in an equitable way. Um, and I do want to mention that 2022-2023 will deliver over 15 more miles of sidewalks. So that's very exciting. So this strategic plan initiative was charged with reviewing all transportation programs um, for, to, in order to improve equitable implementation. So that's a very broad charge. And uh, city leadership directed us to start with the sidewalk petition program and ideally to set up a model for how to apply an equity review that all transportation staff can apply to their own programs. So that's how we got here. And we really started with um, a tool called the equity lens. And the, in the equity, the racial equity lens, there are five questions that we look to data to try to answer. Um, the questions are who is experiencing burden, who is experiencing benefit, what are the racial impacts, what are the root causes of disparities, and what are the unintended consequences. So what we found um, looking back in about 10 years of petitions, uh, we, well what we did is we overlaid the petitions that we've received with the needs, uh, basically roads that are eligible for sidewalks in, through this program that don't have them now. So if you look at this chart, the, the bars, the light blue bars show you the needs, uh, where, are the, where are the eligible streets, and then the line shows you the petitions. Um, so we looked at that across a number of indicators. One of them is prosperity. We looked at race. We looked at ethnicity. And across the board, we found that we were getting overrepresentation of petitions in whiter, more prosperous areas. So the data told us that we, we need some reform to have an equitable program, but what it couldn't answer is what are, what are the root causes of those disparities. So part of our next step is that we want to talk to the community, try to dig more into what are the root causes of this result that we're finding. Uh, I just want to note that through this process, we're, all look, we're also looking to peer cities and finding out what others have done with their petition programs and the types of reforms that are happening um, in other cities that are, that are taking a similar look from an equity perspective. And we're going to incorporate that into program recommendations. So we're working toward a round of community engagement, again, starting out and really trying to dig into the root causes. Um, of the disparities that we're seeing, but ultimately working with the community to reform the, the program um, and bring that revised program forward to council. So that's my summary. I'm happy to take questions. Would love any input that you have. Thank you, Ms. Conlon. Any questions, observations from the commission? I know. You look at me, yeah. Ms. Bravo Taylor. So, um, so you're you are starting to try to figure out how to assess equity. Is that or how to how to how to reach out and and access these communities that haven't been able to partake yet? Is that the step that we're at? 
Yes, I would say, so we're using a very particular framework to evaluate the program. Um, and it's called applying the racial equity toolkit. So you start with data analysis, you look at, um, well, I have a, I have a one pager in front of me, but you start with what result am I seeking? You know, we're seeking an equitable program. You dig into the data, find out where we are now, and then the next step from there is community engagement. So that's where we are. We we are very much leaning on the resources the city has developed in recent years to guide that mm -hmm. effort. We've been in touch with the engagement office. Taisha Hinton is helping us um, form that. We are also looking for some consultant support on that effort and have reached out. So we're, we've got a plan, mm -hmm. um, but that's, yeah, that's the step we're at. Yeah, I think, I guess my concern with relying only on community engagement would be that it is more difficult for these communities to engage, to have the time to engage or to even have the awareness and the time to engage. So I would hope that there's also maybe some, maybe this is with consultant work or some version of the lens that's also looking at even just the numbers of what areas are highly trafficked but missing sidewalks in, um, in some of those uh, areas of need. Like if there's, if there's, you know, some like research based just uh, overlay of need versus use, I guess. Right, trying to gather essentially observational data. Like yeah, where are we seeing yeah people? some sort of observational data because it seems like, uh, yeah, relying solely on community-based engagement would be, uh, would be difficult for, or, or might not lead to the, the equity that we're looking for. That is a great point. Which I know is tricky. <laughs> it is tricky, but that's a really good point because the, you know, again, we don't want to speculate on the root cause of what we observed in the data, but certainly one reason could be a lack of time to participate in the petition program as it is, and that's what we're trying to address. Right. So we need to make sure our engagement doesn't fall pray to the same problem <laughs> in right, order to address right, right. the program. So I hear you completely. Um, I can tell you we, and I'm happy to share, we have kind of a, a strategy, an initial strategy laid out, um, starting with going to people where they are in the neighborhoods that are underrepresented today in the awesome. petition program. So we're very much gonna target mm -hmm. those areas to try to understand, is it a lack of time? Is there a lack of interest in sidewalks in those areas? We just want to document mm -hmm. going and speaking with those folks before we make assumptions. Yeah. Um, but great point, and we'll definitely be looking out for that. Ms. Kellenbeck. Yo, thank you. Yeah, it is a great point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I had the um, good fortune of being inside DOT's office, and I was uh, waiting for something and um, I was sitting near this one particular image where it has on uh, page three the existing sidewalks and then uh, on the other side is the blue where I guess it's eligible sidewalks and what really struck me what stood out was how the sidewalks were really concentrated in the old section of Raleigh that downtown core, and then expands. But as the city continued to grow out, the sidewalks, the investments in the sidewalks were, were not, um, seemed to be on the budget item list. Mm -hmm. And I agree, it seems almost like it's, uh, you could take this as an intuitive approach instead of having, because um, the community isn't giving you feedback, doesn't necessarily mean that it, the need isn't there. Mm -hmm. Right, and so somehow along the way, policies changed in our development of our system, our transportation system, that prioritize car vehicle mobility, and the walking fell off the the um, the list of of needs. So you know, is it possible that we could also approach it by just looking at this map and saying, okay, we see where people are living, we see where the transit lines are, we know that in order to ride the transit, you need to access it, you're gonna probably walk and bike, you're not gonna drive to this bus stop there. Um, yeah, so my question, I guess, is, is that in, can we take an, a proactive approach with just making the decisions like previous generations did before they made these decisions they didn't bring they didn't go out to the public and get input we 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 understood what the need is 
and then we did it. Yeah, so I want to be clear that the engagement we're about to do is not asking people where they want sidewalks. Okay. And this is, I probably wasn't clear enough about this. It's about how the program is structured, whether we want a petition-based program or alternatively, do we want what you're describing, which is a data-driven based program where we overlay all the destinations, we overlay those equity indicators, and we prioritize based on that. I think that's a very p- possible outcome of this process that we move to that approach, but we didn't want to do that without engaging the community first. Again, using that racial equity toolkit approach, mm. um, we want to make sure we got the input on that change in the program. How much time are we anticipating um, in this process of decision making? Of decision making. So originally we were hoping to bring a new program forward to council in December. Um, it's not going to be in December, frankly. We, we've we um, actually had a little, we were trying to gain capacity for this effort through a consultant and we didn't get a lot of interest from our initial um, outreach to consultants. So long story short, I, I think early next year is when we would be bringing forward a revised program recommendation. Okay, so um, does that mean that you're gonna be taking, you it won't be until early next year that you begin collecting data? No, 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 so we w- we're hoping to get started on the engagement process this fall. Okay. But to work through that, and we want to go out to the, the public more than one time. Mm-hmm. So I think it's going to be into next year before we get through all that process and have a recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Caruso. Yeah, I just had a quick question. On, on one of your slides that said um, street improvements, 8.7 million. What, what, what kind of projects does that include? I, I, I guess I wasn't aware that we had street improvements a, a petition available. Yeah, those are for um, adding curb and gutter oh, I see. to streets okay. that don't have them, and it's currently it's a prerequisite. If you if you want to petition for a sidewalk, you first have to petition to get the curb and gutter. Okay, thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, I would like to uh, well thank Ms. Collin once again for the presentation on the uh, sidewalk petition program update. Uh, and the sort of next stage that we're transitioning to. I'd also like to volunteer the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee to support you in that work. Uh, So I hope that um, if there's any way, shape, or form that uh, members of this commission who serve on outreach, or frankly any member of this commission that's interested in advancing um, this sidewalk uh, sort of petition program uh, kind of moving forward, I hope everyone feels encouraged to, uh, to support Ms. Conlon in her work. Uh, I believe we have a double whammy of a presentation from Ms. Conlon. Uh, up next, we have the TIA, TIA process updates uh, from, uh, which I believe is a traffic impact analysis. Thank you. Traffic impact analysis updates, uh, process updates from Ms. Ann Conlon. Okay. I'll try to be brief. Um, Again, so this is my day job actually. Part of my responsibilities are reviewing traffic impact analysis. The, the last presentation was a kind of a side project with the strategic plan initiative. Um, so at your request, I wanted to come here and just tell you a little bit about the program and then leave plenty of time to, for you to guide me in whatever specific questions you have. So I'll just briefly go through what is the purpose of our TIA program, when do we require them? How are Transit Ped and Bike Incorporated? And we have several initiatives underway looking at the program, so I wanna tell you about those, and then we'll get into discussion. So the Raleigh Street Design Manual lays out uh, kind of three purposes for TIAs. Um, first of all, they are a key resource to our development plan reviewers, looking at site plans and subdivisions as they look at how access is laid out for the site and what offsite improvements are needed for development plans. They are used to assist property owners in thinking about the transportation implications of their land use decisions. And then they're uh, a resource to council and planning commission as they're making transportation related policies. So when, I, when you think about, we do, t- we do TIAs at two different points in a process. We complete some of them at rezoning, and some of them are done 
most of them are done at site plan review uh, of a particular site plan or subdivision. So they serve sort of different purposes at those two points. When we do TIAs at rezoning, we're trying to answer the question of what are the potential impacts of the increase in entitlement and are there potential mitigations for those impacts that are feasible? We're not assigning responsibility for those mitigations generally at that rezoning point. When we're looking at a TIA at site plan, we are looking at what are the impacts of what is coming forward right now on the site and what are the mitigations we need and who should be responsible for those. So again, uh, when we look at the criteria for requiring a TIA, it's different at that rezoning stage versus the site plan stage. So at rezoning, you might have a vacant parcel, but there's an existing entitlement. There's a certain amount of homes, for example, that, that the property owner could build on that site. So we try to estimate what are the trips that could be generated by what they have the ability to build by right and compare that to, to the entitlement that they're asking for that proposed zoning entitlement. And we look at the difference between those two things. In the case of site plan, we're looking at, if that's a vacant site, we're comparing what they're gonna build to zero trips to from that vacant site. So this is another thing that we're trying to, to get better at communicating with the public, because it can be confusing at the rezoning stage as we're trying to explain when, why, or why not a TIA is required at that point. So probably of interest to you all, how are we addressing um, pet and bike and transit? Uh, kind of in two ways. So when we run a TIA, the, one of the first things that we look at is how many tr vehicular trips are we expecting to and from this site? And built into an estimate of vehicular trips is an estimate of how people are traveling to and from a site. So if you build um, 10 townhomes in a dense, area, maybe near downtown, uh, you might have some people driving to them, some people walking or biking or using the bus. If you build those in another area that's pretty isolated and far from everybody else, uh, you might have everybody driving to those, those uses. So context matters a lot when we're estimating those trips, and that's something that we, we take into account. Then we directly have multimodal analysis. That's a requirement of any TIA conducted at site plan. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that because that's an area we're working to improve from current practice. So I have three initiatives to briefly share. The first one uh, is that council in the budget this year approved $150,000 to work toward incorporating what is called vehicle miles traveled analysis into our development review. Um, and I could, I could talk about this all day, so I'm gonna to try to be brief, but <laughs> level of service analysis has, has some uses, and it, it can be pretty good at, at looking at a, a kind of a localized site plan impact of a project. But when you apply it at a citywide level, um, looking at, at uh, proge projects in aggregate, you tend to cause the problem you're trying to solve, which is congestion because it tends to lead you to separate uses and kind of spread them out. And what we find is that as you, as you spread them out, um, all the trips that people are making to or from those uses are longer. So the vehicle miles traveled metric is trying to address that problem by directly measuring the total miles per person or per employee to or from a site. And if you measure that directly, then you can work to reduce that, which is what our plans support that we're trying to do, is reduce the overall vehicle miles traveled. Because ultimately, um, that's what the transportation, transportation network has to support, is those miles that are traveled. So we are kicking off with ITRI on this and, and starting our work to try and bring VMT analysis particularly into rezoning is what we think makes the most sense to start using that metric. I mentioned multimodal analysis is an area we're looking to improve. Um, right now our street, our guidelines don't specify exactly what tool consultants need to use uh, when they study multimodal level of service. Some of what has been used in the past, frankly we just haven't felt provided, provided much insight um, 
to the question of what's getting built, um, largely looking at segment-based level of service, you don't see much of a difference between kind of the background scenario, the build scenario, and our our um, frontage improvements are largely at the same as any mitigation that we would get from that analysis. So there's something called a design flags assessment we're moving toward, and this is a tool to help us understand what are the trade-offs of any mitigation. If we say, let's go out of turn lane um, as our mitigation for vehicles, how does that affect other modes? So we're trying to bring that into a little bit more holistic um, decision-making with the mitigations in our TIAs. And then um, some of the industry resources have have come up with some better multimodal tools in recent years, and so we've been incorporating those as we can. And uh, again, I mentioned context, looking at trying to get more accurate estimates of trip generation based on the context in which a site is placed. So with that, I will open it up for questions. I'm going to jump right in for Elizabeth Alley, who's not here tonight, but I know she's asked this question many, many times. Is there any possibility for movement that we could include in the TIA process, the inclusion of bike ped facilities as one of the requirements for the upgrades. Right now, if you reach a certain threshold, it's my understanding that you might have to put in a turn lane, a stoplight, an extra road lane, and these are all automobile focused to capture that automobile traffic we anticipate. Is there a way that we can start working on a process to say you can put in uh, more pedestrian connections, better bike lanes? A transit stop or something like that is there a way how would we go about making recommendations to update that process or update the options for what a developer can put in so you're saying how can we get mitigations in a TIA like a right. sidewalk yes. so one of the challenges that we face is that we don't have the authority to require off-site improvements so a lot, of the, a lot of the time that we get off-site improvements like a traffic signal, that's really enforced by NCDOT because they have that authority. Um, what I do think is a good possibility is that our VMT analysis uh, could tell us at rezoning if we think this is going to negatively impact VMT, there's practices in other cities to then look at mitigations that would be multimodal mitigations like TDM or infrastructure that an applicant could offer um, as a condition if they chose to mitigate that outcome. So there's some potential there, um, but it is a challenge, frankly, with the authority that we have. Um, I guess partly just for information, um, this is going to come to the policy committee um, this week um, to get into further details. So if, if anybody would like to uh, attend, you're more than welcome. But we'll be meeting on Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, in, uh, in the normal place. Um, to, uh, to kind of follow on with that question, do, does the city have authority to um, prioritize the um, the changes that are made as far as e even if they're all on site can we say you must make uh, bike and ped um, improvements prior to um, car infrastructure improvements or is it is that basically left up to the discretion of the of the developer Generally, improvements are either required or not, so there, there isn't kind of a, a priority amongst them. Um, we rely on our site plan regulations and our street sections to make sure that we're getting all that multimodal infrastructure within a subdivision, for example. And so I think to the extent that, you know, that that is insufficient, we can look at that, but we, that's kind of how we handle anything internal to a site. Um, I will just maybe add on to my last answer that we are looking at all modes and we can make recommendations that um, someone can 
can decide to construct even if we don't have the authority to require them which is a, a bit of a distinction but for example with downtown south that is kind of an example of a TIA I could share with you if you wanted an advance of the policy committee where we did make recommendations for multi-use offsite facilities that the the developer is building um, and and also I guess just um do you, do you have like a general what what's the general um, like schedule and timeline as far as um, when when we should expect kind of this process like you know how how long are we from um, a, a summary report or you know moving this along um, like where are we at in the process generally speaking? Do you mean with the VMT initiative? Well, or? yeah, I mean I guess with with the whole. TIA review initiative. Uh, yeah, I guess VMT specifically, yeah. Um, that one's the most concrete. The other two are something we're incrementally trying to improve as we scope every TIA. Okay. Um, so the, the VMT initiative, I I don't have a timeline. We've, <laughs> we're trying, we're still trying to get under contract. Um, I would say over the next year, we're targeting to be able to incorporate VMT and what we'd like to do is bring forward text changes to the street design manual to encode the use of VMT if we find that it's a good tool as we dig in. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Collin. Just briefly, uh, as far as these text changes are concerned, I imagine uh, this commission would be excited to support you in that effort. So you please let us know uh, where, when we need to be there for you, okay. we will be there. I, I Ms. do have Ms. a question. Gellenberg? Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I noticed uh, the acronym LOS uh, when um, there was a, when I when it was multimodal. And am I assuming is that level of service? Mm -hmm. What uh, uh, are you measuring or assessing for the multimodal infrastructure so that the level of service grade is high? So the, if, when we use MMLOS, yeah, that multimodal level of service, yeah. um, based on kind of practice over the last five years, we've used a tool that is related to empirical surveys of people walking and biking and what's comfortable for them. So it is about the width of the space they have. It's about the volume of vehicles near them and um, things like that. So you're assessing the comfort and security mm -hmm. that the users have experience yeah. in the infrastructure. Yeah. And so if they get it, if, if that design gets a D, then it gets improved? Well, uh, currently <laughs> our, our UDO is, is what is the basis for when we can require mitigation and it says level of service E is acceptable, which was, which was a change that, frankly, we did to not get excessive vehicular mitigations. You know, before, if you, if you require level of service D, you can end up kind of over-widening roads for a very narrow peak of traffic. Um, when it comes to bike and ped, again, the, the question isn't what is the level of service, the question is how much did this development affect the level of service? Because when mm. you're requiring a mitigation from the developer, it has to be tied to their impact which is kind of the problem we've had with applying that multi-mill level of service. We can't necessarily tie their impact to the problem. So they're not required to mitigate an existing problem necessarily. Are we still assessing uh, a streets to LOS uh, based on efficiency or traffic flow instead of safety? The TIA requirements for level of service are based on traffic flow, yes. Thank you. There is, there is also a, a safety analysis required in TIAs, I should say. Safety analysis for vulnerable road users? It, it's agnostic to road user. It looks at crashes, crash rates, and severity of those crashes in order to identify safety issues. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Collin. Any further questions from the commission? 
Hearing none, Ms. Conlon, we deeply appreciate you and all of your work. Thank you for being with us tonight. The Commission will proceed moving forward with our reports. We are now wrapping up the evening. Uh, for the Chair's report, we'll get started. Uh, it's been certainly an active uh, month. Uh, we've uh, had everything from meetings with Mr. Caruso and uh, another colleague, uh, Mr. Tyler O'Farrell with Kimley Horn, as, as well as an Oaks and Spokes board member to discuss uh, traffic impact analysis, uh, yeah, vehicle miles traveled reduction efforts uh, in the city. Um, of course, we had the BPAC outreach uh, committee meeting uh, at which uh, Ms. Gallenbeck joined us and shared uh, her research and thoughts on the e-bike uh, rebate program up in Connecticut, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And I think she'll be sharing a, just a brief thought about that this evening uh, during her remarks. Uh, I, as mentioned earlier, I had a meeting uh, with the uh, um, visiting scholar Dan uh, Anderson. I uh, invited him to join us tonight. I uh, attended the Greenway Committee meeting on the 12th of September. We heard updates from the Triangle Land Conservancy, uh, as well as the Awake Cultural Paths nonprofit. Uh, attended a meeting with uh, Planning Commissioner Dwight Otwell. Uh, glad to have him back with us uh, this evening. We discussed, uh, of course, bike and pedestrian infrastructure and future growth and development of our city. Uh, attended the uh, District C City Council Candidates Forum. Uh, at which there were, in fact, questions about bike lanes uh, seemingly showing up overnight in certain communities and brought to mind the importance of uh, active engagement with our community. Uh, also participated in the first uh, fancy women's bike ride uh, organized uh, here in Raleigh by Allie Mabel uh, with support from Oaks and Spokes and Carnal Bike Share. Saw Commissioner McLean there as a volunteer. Uh, also saw Commissioner Gellenbeck out looking quite fancy uh, in her attire. Uh, and I believe there are photographs taken by uh, Mrs. Thomas, if I'm not mistaken, who was also Perfect. looking quite yes, fancy. Fancier than usual. Mm-hmm. So that was quite, uh, it was actually a great turnout for the event. And uh, again, you know, the idea being to get uh, women out on their bikes and encouraging a more inclusive cycling uh, network uh, in the city. Uh, it was a great ride. Also attended uh, a community engagement uh, session meeting, I should say a community engagement meeting with Ms. Burris and Ms. Taisha Hinton, our community engagement uh, director for the city of Raleigh. We had a good conversation about, uh, you know, again, active engagement uh, across our city uh, as relates to bike and ped infrastructure. And last but not least, I had a meeting with the Triangle Off-Road Cyclists, a nonprofit, uh, and the uh, Crank Arm Brewing. Uh, a, a business here uh, in the city of Raleigh to discuss future mountain bike trails, cyclocross tracks, and pump tracks in the city of Raleigh. So it's been a very active month. And of course, on top of that, visited a number of these park projects included in the parks bond, uh, the parks and greenways, and et cetera. We won't go through all of those. But <laughs> all that to say, it's been a very active uh, 30 past days <laughs> since I last saw <laughs> all of you uh, in August for our previous uh, commission meeting. Uh, we'll proceed with our committee reports. I've already taken care of outreach. Uh, let's proceed, how about with uh, policy? Uh, well, policy ha hasn't met yet. Like I mentioned, we will meet uh, this Thursday, uh, 1 p.m., uh, to continue um, to dive into the um, TIA process and, and um, VMT analysis. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Caruso. And I believe that uh, Mr. Tong, who is our chair for our planning committee, uh, well, first of all, I believe planning is going to meet next week. Is that right? Have you, are you scheduled to meet next week? Okay, so there you go. So that was a brief report. Uh, then uh, we should all wish Mr. Tong well. I think Miss uh, Miss Alley as well. I think they're both out sick this evening, so we want to send them our best. Uh, we shall proceed now uh, with our staff reports. A couple things, and more than a couple, and I'll try to go through them quick. But if anyone has any questions, I will hang around at the end, um, just in respect for everyone's time. Um, couple announcements regarding public meetings. Um, we did have several this past weekend that went well. We had um, two public meetings for the Chavis to Dick Strollway, um, trying to narrow down the scope of that project. There will be likely more meetings at some point. However, those uh, that hasn't been decided yet, and I don't have an 
any additional information, but that project is continuing to move forward. Um, we also had a scooter outreach event this past Saturday. Uh, the city hosted uh, a scooter swag on Glenwood South from two to four with the goal of encouraging uh, riders to learn about the importance of properly parking their scooters. Um, especially in on Glenwood Ave where we have designated scooter corrals. Anything to add to that? Nope. Um, on October 6th, we have the five point open study open house um, from 4.30 to 7.30. Um, that is going to have an overview of the project to date um, and provide a chance for people to comment on a range of intersection concepts and to share priorities. So again, that is October 6th at the Five Point Center for Active Adult Adults from 4.30 to 7.30. We also have um, Walktober coming up. Um, we have three events, um, Walk to School Day, which is a nationally recognized day, is on um, October 5th. So far, there have not been any schools that have reached out to ask for the city's participation. Um, but if you know of a school or want to encourage a school, uh, we are always happy to go out and support their efforts. Um, on October 22nd, our um, counterparts over in transit in our TDM group are hosting a chocolate and trains um, Walktober event um, with some chocolate and then a walking tour um, from Vidiri Chocolate to Raleigh Union Station and a tour of the station. And then on October 25th, there will be a walk in our um, virtual seminar. Uh, we also have a couple updates. The one regarding scooters, um, as September 1st, Bolt is no longer a vendor for the city of uh, Raleigh. Um, we did not seek a third, we did not, we chose not to seek a third vendor to replace Bolt through the remainder of this term. Um, so as a result, the, uh, their maximum device deployment will be split between our other two vendors, Lime and Spin, um, adding 125 devices to each maximum um, for each company. Each vendor will be allowed a maximum device deployment of 375 through the remainder of the current um, agreement term, which is May 2023. Um, annual resurfacing is still on is still currently going. Um, so some updates with that. Um, this upcoming week, they will be working on Crabtree Boulevard, which is going to be adding some ADA access ramps. Um, there will be. Uh, also doing the final resurfacing for Pleasant Valley Road, which will be adding um, bike lanes, and Little Briar Creek was just completed, which also includes bike lanes. Um, and then regarding um, Hillsborough Street, just, um, I know there is a question of that. I did talk to our folks over in traffic engineering. It still is on their radar. Um, my understanding from the discussion with them is uh, there's a pretty small window in, in timing which they could get it done because of um, the need to um, restrict parking. They were working with the Hillsborough Street Community Service Corporation to figure out the timing on that. By the time um, there's a really tight window um, and it got too f far into the fall um, to be able to do the work and then they didn't have a contractor anymore to do the work. It is still on their radar. They just got a new contractor this past month and they are back in communication with Hillsborough Street to figure out a time to do it. So it, it still is on their radar. Thank you. That is all I have, Kenneth. 
Uh, just one update. You probably heard it referenced by myself and Ann, um, the newly kind of restructured division that Eric had. There's been some new pieces that have been brought in um, that I will be overseeing. We ha do have a name. Uh, so it's mo we are now Mobility Strategy and Infrastructure Division, um, part of the Transportation Department. We're excited to have this new banner and all come together under this and looking forward to it's really coming together to, to move things forward. So we certainly appreciate everyone on the commission's support. Very nice. Thank you. I suppose hearing no further updates from staff. <laughs> Unless <laughs> anyone has a question out about Unless, Yeah, are there any questions from the commission? Hearing none, uh, we shall proceed with uh, oh, general board comments. Uh, any general board comments? I know, Ms. Gallenbeck, this might be a good opportunity to mention briefly your findings with the e-bike rebate program. Mm. Uh, and then I think Mr. Thomas may have also had a comment to make as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yes, Mayor Baldwin put a request that BPAC explore it, which I got in, uh, very excited about because I've been monitoring or watching the news come in across the nation about e-bike rebate incentives. And I thought that that would be really for like a statewide uh, implementation, but it turns out that there are 30 cities in the United States that have their own individual ebate, yeah. And the way that I found that out is I reached out to an advocate in Connecticut. Her name is Kate Rosen, and I forwarded uh, to the commissioners her email. Inside her email uh, is a document that was, uh, it's a spreadsheet created by the Transportation Research and Education Center in Portland University or at Portland University, and it's there where I kind of came across all the different cities and all the different types of plans. Some of them are uh, rebates that are issued right from the point of sale, so when you're in the store. Another could be a lending library, and one could be like the one that's happening in Durham, <laughs> where it's a, an e-bike loan participation program where they're issuing out e-bikes and all the necessities to be able to use them for the people who are working in Durham's downtown area. And by participating in that, they are collecting research on the bicycle, be bicycle rider's behavior to better understand. So creating, um, and I think they're gonna use that for their um, developing network for bicycle infrastructure. But the really cool thing about these e-bikes in rebate incentives is that it will complement the Raleigh's bike share program that currently exists. Um, the bike share program has been a huge success from what we can tell by the data, but it does has limitations. And uh, because of the docking station design. And when I was able to acquire an e-bike myself, all of a sudden I'm now able to access bike riding as a mode of transportation. And so with e-bikes outselling EVs two to one last year in 2021, they do seem like an incredible opportunity to provide an affordable electric vehicle for our community. So I think this is something that we should support the mayor with and, and um, you know, move forward. With that, Commissioner, I will uh, open the floor to anybody who wants to add. Any thoughts, questions from the commission? on the e-bike rebate program that Ms. Kellenbeck has been exploring. Well, just briefly, I'd say we had a great conversation about the program during our BPAC outreach committee meeting, and we'll be moving forward in contacting some colleagues of ours who work at the state level uh, to hear more about their thoughts as it relates to our pursuit of it here at the municipal level. Yeah, I mean, there were some pretty incredible ideas for how to get the money. Um, Commissioner Thomas can explore that, but um, there's there's money there. You can start with just a small amount and really make an impact. So I think it's worth it. Thank you, Ms. Gellenbeck. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thomas. I, I just want to I thank city staff for the update on Hillsborough Street. Um, I've been asking about this. I look back at the minutes since I think uh, May of 2021. Uh, and and I, I want to point out the section that I that I have in mind that I'm concerned about is from on Hillsborough Street from Poland Road to Dixie Trail. And there are there are three 
Cardinal bike share stations in that stretch, and that stretch is less than a mile. Um, th there will be three, right? There were, there were three, there are two. One got wiped out in a car crash, which I think kind of speaks to the urgency of needing to restore those lanes. Um, and, and I just see this corridor being used heavily by cyclists, and in many cases and in long stretches, those lanes are completely gone. They're, they're absent, there's no evidence that there was a bike lane there. Uh, so I, I just feel like there is a sense of urgency uh, and I wanna see this get moved along sooner rather than later. So thank you for the update, I appreciate it. I will continue to push our colleagues on it. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Burris. Any further comment from the board? I'd like to add just one more brief one, and that is that in my neighborhood, um, there was a intersection that was converted to a four-way stop. They added stop signs on uh, Fairview Road, and the, uh, the impact it's had has been immediate. Uh, there is a higher uh, communication between road users now that that is present. Uh, before, the drivers were ignoring the speed limit. And now when we come to that intersection, uh, there's an awareness that there's opposing traffic. Uh, so that's been a huge input or improvement for traffic calming. But one thing that I also noted was that the stop sign that went on Fairview Road where the speeders were going, it only put in a stop sign. So there, the drivers were um, going straight through the stop sign because of the new pattern. But what I also noticed is that there were aggressive drivers when there was a driver at the stop sign and the driver behind them aggressively went around them. So they entered into the opposing traffic lane to pass them at the intersection. So my question is, when we put a stop sign in, do we automatically add the stop bar to increase awareness for drivers that this uh, is a stop intersection or a stop stopping point on the road I unfortunately do not know that level of detail but we can speak with our traffic operations folks and I think part of it could be timing with regards to the installation of the of a thermoplastic but we can get that information follow up great and then in addition to that I think it's really important when we do put those stop signs in that we also include uh, parallel crosswalk bars that can inform drivers that this is a multimodal use intersection. So you're to expect walkers in addition to vehicle drivers who are trying to enter onto the road. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Gellenbeck. Hearing no further, oh, Sorry. Mr. Otwell. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drag it out just one more second. I'd like to say that I have a, I've officially tendered my resignation to the BPAC, and I'd like to thank Chair Neptune for allowing me to continue to serve until a replacement is found. I'm on the Planning Commission now, if you haven't heard, um, and it is a quite a time commitment, so that's where I'll be putting my efforts going forward. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I still want to be really involved in this discussion around bicycle and pedestrian safety and development in the city. Um, it's been an honor to serve on this commission. It's been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life, and worked with some of the most talented and passionate people, both from the city and on the commission side. And I hope that these relationships continue going forward. And thank you, everybody. Mr. Otwell, thank you for those uh, kind and generous remarks. I suspect it's safe to say that everyone on this commission has enjoyed the privilege of serving along your side uh, and deeply appreciated your leadership uh, as a former chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission. And we look forward to continuing our work and service together as you transition fully to the Planning Commission for the City of Raleigh. Hearing no further comment from the Commission, we'll proceed with upcoming events, of which I have a few. Uh, briefly, you know, we are in the midst of an election cycle, and I'd love to encourage all of you to make your way to any number of upcoming opportunities for various candidate forms, including this Wednesday for District D. Uh, there is a District D City Council form at Trophy Brewing on Morgan uh, this Wednesday, the 21st, from 6 to 8. Uh, there is uh, an at-large City Council member uh, form on September 27th at Art Space from 6 to 8 p.m. There is a District E City Council member form uh, on September 29th from 6 to 8. And then there's a Mayor's form on October 1st 
from 2 to 4.30. All the details and information on this can be found at wakeupwakecounty.org.org. Again, wakeupwakecounty.org. Uh, and as a relevant note here, early voting will begin on October 20th, so a month from uh, tomorrow. October 20th, early voting will begin and will run through November 5th. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Oaks and Spokes, our friends with Oaks and Spokes, they are gearing up for their annual uh, fundraiser, Crank for a Cause. Would love to see as many of you out there supporting. Uh, that'll be on October 30th. Oh, all right. how about that? Well, please uh, consider October, October 30th. 30th. October 30th. Uh, crank for a Cause. Uh, sounds like Mr. Otwell will be leading. Come join me. Yeah, it's be Please fun. come join Mr. Otwell. I'll certainly be participating as well. We'd love to see all of you. Any other upcoming events from our commissioners? Uh, hearing none, we will proceed with a confirmation of our next BPAC meeting. That is scheduled for Monday, October 17th, uh, 2022 at 6 p.m. My friends, my colleagues, it's been a full night. Thank you so much for your service to our community. With that said, our commission is adjourned. <laughs>